going to be led into this by Balloon Burning, which I don't know if I would say is my favorite song on the album. Not because I didn't like it, but I think it's the most interesting song on the album. And you'll probably very quickly recognize the bass line in it. Um, I know because we're running a little bit long. The Pretty Things, interestingly enough, don't have a huge history before they release this album, but they've got some interesting tidbits about them. So I'll just share a couple. The biggest thing about this album is that there are a lot of people that consider this to be the first rock opera album ever. It's a concept album. Um, mm. For those that may know, you know, we talked about the Kinks last week. They, they went on a run of rock operas. A lot of people know Tommy and Quadrophenia from The Who. Um, a lot of people have said that Tommy was influenced by this. Pete Townsend, of course, said no, but does anybody really believe Pete Townsend on anything like that? I love The Who, but let's be honest. And you can see it because um, there are elements of this in terms of both the narrative and the structure of the album that do resemble Tommy and Quadrophenia. So if you're familiar with those albums, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting companion piece for those. Uh, the main character is the, also the title of the album, SF Sorrow. He's the protagonist. So each song relates to him. Um, the album specifically was designed to not have a coherent sound because it's supposed to we'll go into what, what the, the theme is uh, for the album, but it's supposed to basically follow SF Sorrow through childhood to happier times to almost the equivalent of a, a mental break and then acceptance of the fact that life isn't fair. Um, and that's in the most general sense what this album is about. Uh, I would say like most rock operas and concept albums, musicians make better musicians than novelists. And that's why there's different. And this is no, no, uh, no different on that. Um, uh, I think in terms of the band itself and knowing about them, probably the most famous member of the band is Dick Taylor, uh, who is known for being in the original Rolling Stones, uh, he, the very first Rolling Stones. He was actually a classmate of Mick Jagger and, Keith Richards. And I think it's like he just left the Rolling Stones because it wasn't particularly floating his boat at that time to go to <laughs> art school. And then, you know, like you'd think that it would become one of those things where it's like, oh, man, worst decision ever. And you could still probably make that argument. But he still managed to just decide to start doing music again and release this album, which was, yeah. you know, strong enough that it was the number 18th ranked album in 1968 and overall, you know, 913. So it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, the, the lineup of the band changed consistently. Um, their most well-known lineup and the one that played on this album, uh, actually maybe not their most well-known, but the album that, uh, the lineup that played on this album uh, was Dick Taylor playing guitar, uh, Phil May on the vocals, um, and then they had uh, Brian Pendleton on rhythm guitar, and they had just moved over from Viv Prince to... Wally Waller. These are like fantastic, like 60s band <laughs> names, by the way. There's also Skip Allen was on the drums. There's two different guys named Viv who were drummers at different times for the band. So, um, <laughs> you know, and so it's just it's it's almost like as if you were going to like create like a, an archetype of like a British rock band. Um, these would be the names you have. None of them are too long. Very British. You know, people don't have names like Viv and Dick anymore, you know. so there Unfortunately. You yes, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm going to let that one lay. But uh, uh, so it was released in uh, December 1968. Uh, it was well received in Great Britain, but it had a fatal flaw that it came out the same week as the White Album. So it was a little bit overshadowed. What's by, that uh, one? I don't know what that yeah, is. By, well, you know, we'll, we'll probably talk about that a little bit uh, when I say a little bit, a lot later in the, uh, the countdown on this. But because of that, it kind of got buried a little bit. But it's a well-regarded album by musicians. It was actually uh, engineered by Norman Hurricane Smith, who also engineered a bunch of Beatles albums. And also did Pink Floyd's Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which is a contemporary album, too. So um, I thought that was interesting because it doesn't necessarily sound like those albums, the Beatles albums and, and that Pink Floyd album. And uh, Dick Taylor actually at the end of this left the band because he was frustrated at their lack of commercial success. And that sort of was when the band went from being sort of a psychedelic band to being a hard rock band. Kind of like the Kinks, where we talked about how there were five different bands. The Pretty Things went from being this version of the band, which was considered more psychedelic, to being a hard rock band in the in the 70s. And then they actually became a new wave band in the early oh, really? 80s. Yeah, which I, I 
at some point I'll check that out, but I think by that point they were not considered the pretty things in terms of any classic lineup or classic work. But yep, that's it moves with the times, huh? That they were they were the first British act signed on Motown Records, which I also found really interesting. It was <laughs> wow. a, a spin-off called Rare Earth Records. Um it did not last very long, <laughs> and uh, but this was probably the most well-known album on that spinoff. So this was Motown's attempt to kind of jump on the British invasion, albeit a little bit late. So, I mean, Lord knows there's been enough appropriation of Motown music and, and R&B music that it's only fair that Motown would attempt to have a British invasion band. So um, real quick before I throw it to you guys, it's uh, SFSAR stands for Sebastian S. Uh, Sebastian F. Sorrow. Here's the narrative at the most, at its most basic. He's born to ordinary parents in a factory town. He, and I, I tried to flesh this out before looking into it and actually is relatively easy to figure out towards the end, but there's a reason for that. So he's born to ordinary parents in a factory town, takes a job as a, as a scab, a non-union worker at a factory. And over time, his colleagues hate him. However, there is one girl who he falls in love with who's across the street who's sort of like both his significant sexual awakening and the person who understands him and saves him for the work he hates he marries her and then he gets drafted into the army uh it's not going so well in the army but he's just excited to be joined by his fiance who is going to join him in america well she gets into a a dirigible accident i.e like the hindenburg and dies and so that leads to the middle of the album, which is just basically an extended psychedelic, you know, portion of the album, which is pining his subconsciousness. He apparent this is where it starts to get harder to figure out in the lyrics. <laughs> he meets a Haitian voodoo doctor who <laughs> then allows him to explore his inner self, and he becomes aware of the existential mess that his life has become. It makes him mistrustful of others, and he ends up living the rest of his life in seclusion, which you can tell in the last couple songs. But that is the song not surprisingly the band was doing just a metric ton of lsd at this time <laughs> and and i have to share this before i turn it off because they tried to perform this album twice like as a a piece that they were performing as the concept album uh the first time <laughs> went so poorly that they weren't allowed to perform it anymore and basically the person who was handling the 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 I guess the, the scripting of it and running it almost like a director was so high on LSD that he forgot his cues and was ad-libbing and the band themselves were yeah. not comfortable doing it. They also used what was called a twink character, which I'm guessing is like a stereotypically, real stereotypically, real stereotypically <laughs> homosexual character that apparently went over like a lead balloon even in 1969's <laughs> Great Britain. So you can only imagine what that must have been like. But anyway... They didn't do that. So then they try again in 1998 and they go to Abbey Road Studio Number 2 to do it. And they're, they're live on TV for this. And basically there's a guy providing narration uh, named Arthur Brown, who is a spoken word artist. David Gilmore from Pink Floyd was lead guitar for this as a guest player. And basically they, they do it and it was, it was broadcast on Netcast. <laughs> <laughs> like the Netscape uh, version of... Oh, jeez. We were talking earlier about like using digital technology that was ancient. Like Netcast is about as old school as it gets. But I, anyway, I, Netcast crashed. <laughs> so no one oh. was able to see this live. <laughs> and basically they released it as like a as an attempt to tape the Netcast stream or whatever in 1998, you know, constituted streaming. And they released it as something called Resurrection and made it into a DVD. So... Yeah, if you want to check it out, I guess Resurrection is around somewhere. I, I was curious to look for it, but as you might expect, it is not readily available on YouTube, YouTube and other platforms. But yeah, they tried to do it twice, but um, they they were not able to pull it off for different reasons. You stopped one time due to late 90s technology and the first time due to the effects of trying to organize something when everybody's on LSD. So anyway, that's that's an overview of, of SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things, an interesting album. You know, Josh, let's start with you. What would you think? Well, uh, this sounds completely like an art school project based on what you've described. Um, the fact I didn't even pick up on the fact that it was a concept album, which makes so much more sense um, reading the 
the tracks and, and hear, remembering some of the lyrics that they were talking about and the sounds. Um, uh, the only point that I could compare to is it sound with that psychedelia sound. It sounds like all of the parts on those late Beatles albums where they're use, incorporating psychedelia um, into their sounds, you know, like on Yellow Submarine and things like that. Um, but this is like just taking those parts and only doing that. Um, and that's why I struggled to... Um, to like this album <laughs> now what did you what did you think guys i love this album <laughs> Holy <I'm surprised>. shit. <laughs> this this is by far my favorite album we've listened to i haven't been this excited about a new album in freaking years i i am so blown away i can't believe i've never heard any of this i didn't know any of these guys i didn't know any of the story john i did double the research this week because i wanted to learn so much about this and i was so i all the stuff that you just said i had already looked up um mm -hmm. holy crap I, I i first listened to it in my headset which i i would have to say if you do listen to this with headphones and i agree yes it's, I, it's, it's big and you're sensitive to stereo music uh, there's a lot of playing around here that they're going back and forth from left to right, and it's a little disorienting. Mm -hmm. so I, I actually wrote, Matt, yeah. instruments are smashing into my headphones yes. for the first song, SF Sorrow is Bored, to give you an idea how on the same page And it doesn't there. get any easier, right? So I don't think that this is an easy – this wasn't an easy listen for me with my headset. Um, but it, I had one of those moments, the fourth song, Private Sorrow. It, it's w w There's this flute part. It's kind of like – it's like very Jethro Tull, I found, very kind of proggy. It, there's just – Every now and then I'll hear a song and there'll be this part that just happens in the song and it's so unique and it's so unexpected and there's cool rhythm behind it. And I totally felt that with that, that I was out for a walk and I was like, whole, I, freaking lightning struck me, man. That was, I, I thought that was a really, really cool part. And, you know, the rest of the album was kind of just there. Um, but I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. And as I read more about it, as I started listening to it more and more, I just, I loved it. This is a, the, I love the fact that this is the first rock opera and, uh, or considered it, and it's only 41 minutes long, right? Mm -hmm. So unlike Tommy or The Wall or these, or Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, these albums that are double albums that have a lot of filler, to me, there really wasn't any filler on this at all. It, this, th this is a stellar album, and I am just... I'm very much uh, impressed by it. Uh, to me, it was, and I actually disagree with you, John. I think that this actually does sound very much like Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Pink Floyd in a lot of different mm. places. Okay. Um, uh, and interestingly enough, something that I read too, I don't know if you saw this, John, but while they recorded this at Abbey Road Studios, and at the same time, the Beatles were recording the White Album and Pink yes. Floyd was recording Piper at the Gates yep. of Dawn. Mm -hmm. And um, they actually borrowed. And the producer that. was actually working on all three of them, yeah. which is pretty remarkable. And they borrowed George Harrison's sitar on the song Death. So uh, huh. because it was just hanging out there and he wasn't there. But um, to I me, feel like everybody was just exchanging sitars, girlfriends, drugs yeah. during that era. Yeah. So <laughs> pass them around. Yeah. Um, but to me, this basically sounded like you take early Pink Floyd. You take mid late period Beatles like Sgt. Pepper, um, uh, Magical Mystery Tour Beatles, and basically the, the Who, Tommy, the Who. You put that in a blender, and this is what you're going to get um, uh, with splashes of Jethro Tull, Genesis, and Black Sabbath. Um, as far as uh, as far as what oh. I was hearing, uh, not a lot of Black Sabbath. Not, uh, a lot, yeah. not a lot. I said splashes <laughs> because if you listen, if you listen to that, I thought this the other day when you listen to. Uh, Old Man Gathering, the second to last song, there's guitar in there that I was like, this sounds like Sabbath guitar. All right, let's, let's walk back a little bit yeah. because I think I find, kind of fall in the middle on this. I, I found this to be an extremely interesting album. And interesting is a positive adjective for me. It's not me trying to talk around stuff. There's a lot of stuff going around. In the set. It's ambitious. I, I like the ambition. I like what they were trying to do. There's definitely songs in here where what I like about it is, as Matt said, you get there's a there's bass lines that'll come out of nowhere. There's you know smashing electric guitar comes mm -hmm. up. There's all kinds of different stuff. The drumming is interesting in the so from that end of things, big plus. Lyricism, I mean, I appreciate what they're trying to do, and it certainly is not you know brutal like in the previous album where it's sort of derived, or, or like the Buckley album where it's you know derivative to the point of being insincere, right? I didn't hear all, uh, it, Magical Mystery Tour Beatles. I think 
absolutely I can see hints of that for sure, especially in the production. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I actually think in many ways this is sort of the evolution to that prog rock that would come in like the mid-70s. And, and yeah. Matt mentioned some bands there. I, I didn't get as much of a Pink Floyd vibe. Pink Floyd's a little more atmospheric for me in the early stages than Do this you, is. Have you listened to Piper at the Gates of Dawn? I have, yep. And I and, and like I said, I I, I see why, yeah. you know, in terms of the production you're getting that, but I it's a different feel. I actually you know who it, it reminds me of is yes. If I was gonna do a band okay. of anybody, I would say that yes would be the band. Uh, you know, that that mid seventies yes seems to be the line right here because they do have sort of more aggressive guitar parts than um than a lot of prog rock bands do you know until we start getting into like the rushes of the world right mm-hmm. which and this does not sound like a rush album no. um but you know it's it's much more of that you know the, the pure heroin of of uh of prog than like sort of the the stuff that came later but it's it's a i, I would argue there's no death is apps is death it's filler um in this album and there are definitely some songs that are that are transitioning you there, but right when mm-hmm. they're about to lose you, they do put in songs that are both good and interesting. And that would be why for me, this falls in the, you definitely should listen to this both for the historical context, but also because it's a very interesting, ambitious album, especially when you consider the time that it was released. I don't know if it's going to be for everybody. No. I don't even know if it's for me all the time, but, and I don't know if it has high re listenability for me. But I'm glad that I listened to it. I was familiar with the pretty things because uh, I have a father who uh, loves the Stones and uh, you know, and also loves garage rock. And the pretty things were a garage rock band before this, and so that's an interesting thing to know too that they went from being the straight ahead garage rock to hey, let's do a rock opera. <laughs> and there wasn't much in between. And when I say that, you listen, and it's it's as if you you took straight ahead garage rock and then just turned it into you know magical mystery tour Beatles without anything without like help or rubber soul yeah. or revolver or Beatles for sale in between right so it's kind of yeah that's that's what I would say but yeah there's my take yeah so Josh what what about you like would you say Matt and I are, dro- are going deep into dropping a lot of other band comparisons do you have ones yourself or are you more like not drawing on those comparisons and just taking it as it is yeah, I'm more just taking it as it is. Uh, I liked when the album was more like hard rocking, like mm-hmm. in Defecting Gray. That's what I, and, and as you know, that's what I respond to when, when we're sure. listening to like Iron Maiden and more like hard mm-hmm. rock and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I it, love you, I Matt, have, but I don't know where you got Black Sabbath from. There ain't, listen there ain't to, no Black listen Sabbath to in here. Old Man Gathering. There and I'm, and that's why I say peppered in when there's there's a guitar part in that that is very to me I I, I just heard that and I just said that's a, that's a Black Sabbath sound, um I, just in, in one guitar part I wouldn't say it's peppered in throughout the album but Old Man Gathering I absolutely heard it for sure. Maybe it's just the fact that like I, I have a hard time with psychedelia in general like that sound of music and stuff and and that's a lot of the or a few of the albums that we've talked about so far. Um, so maybe I don't need a whole rock opera about it. Yeah. Um, the, the back end of the so, album, by the way, is much stronger than the front end of the album. I would, I would say. Yeah. I opinion. like the last, the last three or four songs. I think it, I think it, I would agree. It does end very well. Um, From the old man gathering until the end, you're running through a bunch of good songs. Um, the, the first part of the first part of the album. Is I would even say trust is a really good song too, but yeah, I, I think, well, I, yeah. honestly, I, I stopped listening after loneliest person because uh-huh. that's, that's where I, cause that's part of what we've talked about before. I think with some of these yep. older albums, there's been a lot of reissues and they've attacked on songs at the end of them. And that mm-hmm. song, I think that Josh, that you mentioned that you really liked, that was more guitar driven. That was more of a single. That wasn't actually part of the album. That was like the first oh. song after the the out the proper album. Yeah. So I stopped mm-hmm. listening to it because I don't want to. Yeah, do I didn't have it in my notes, so it's it's yeah it, yeah, it wasn't a part of the original album. But um, but I just I don't and I, you're right. There, there I uh, something like the Well of Destiny, which isn't really like a song. It's kind of like a two minute, one what, minute and a half kind of just. It's there. It's like sounds. I I did find like a cool guitar part, and I don't know. I've listened to enough. You know what might be a better comparison, Matt? Like, mm-hmm. and I'll I'll use loneliest person to do it, and you can tell me. Instead of Black Sabbath, I'd say more like Iron Butterfly. 
would be more like what the guitar is like for those that you know know Inagata De Vida and stuff like that. It's not as aggressive as Black Sabbath, but it does have that guitar driven stuff, and that Possibly. that would be what I, I would mean, say. I yeah, I'm not terribly familiar with them, but I and, and it's just it's just one part. It's just one guitar part that I was that I thought that's what came to mind. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. Like to me, I, I like the var- there's a lot of variety on here. There's a lot of things. I thought the Who was all over this. You know, um, and they actually hmm. said from like the song, uh, what was it? Um, oh, this, the Old Man Gathering, the beginning of that. They're, they basically said, yeah, they uh, Pete Townsend totally ripped off that for a uh, pinball wizard from that song. Um, and yes, that in fairness, that is very derivative. <laughs> now, the rest of it, the, I, 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 I thought, think Quadrophenia in particular is a much better album than this. But, mm-hmm. it, you know, Quadrophenia is not for everybody. But I don't really some know of that is also because, actually. Well, some of that is also because the Who is instrumentalists are remarkable instrumentalists. Yeah. And so in fairness, that's a little bit, you know, it's hard to, to you know, John Entwistle and Keith Moon. It's hard to, but yeah. Yeah. But I, I did like it. Like I said, I think it's good. It's 41 minutes long, man. It, it gets in and gets out. Yeah. So I, I do, I do like that. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why, why it holds my attention. But um, yeah, man, I'm a big fan. I hope we get more of these. I was very excited about this mm-hmm. as you can tell. So um, I, I think that's one of the best things that, you know, you live, you're around for decades, you know, 40 years and you've heard a lot of music and stuff. And then every now and then something still surprises you that takes you. It's like, how yeah. did I not know about this? Holy crap. So, so strong, strong recommendation for Matt. What yep. do you say, Josh? Um, I say thumbs down for me, okay. honestly. Gotcha. Um, I didn't. Um, one quick question or thought. Um, why do you, do you find that the, the idea of a concept album works in today's day and age of singles driven music? And do you feel like these songs like build on each other and you, you hear the story and in, in the through lines throughout the I, I think it depends. Album. I think it's where people get in trouble with concept albums who are musicians is forgetting their musicians primarily and they they think they become too in their mind literate. And like I said before, I think it's sometimes you wanna you wanna write something that first and foremost comes together with a musical. I'll I'll use like American Idiot by Green Day as an example of you can do it in this Mm -hmm. day and age right um and that was well received and it was a great album but the reason is because the songs are remarkable and sound different and you know billy joe armstrong was not trying to you know become the next great writer right you know he still was and i think what helped was he was moored in like a punk sensibility where he wrote tight catchy stuff and then could expand on it and that's i think what helped this album a little bit is dick taylor and and the other members of the group you know they started as a garage rock band so they they know how to write pieces that have that tightness to it and expand on it with the psychedelic stuff so so i would say for me you can do a concept album but uh, to, to use a word out of context but that might make sense it, it can very quickly become masturbatory if you if it's in the wrong hands yeah i don't think anybody's ever going to defend any rock opera and say this is a stellar piece of literature or writing you know it, it's the stories from my understanding from a lot of rock operas that they're, it's just confusing meandering you know kind of str- you know stringing together different aspects of somebody's life and you know it's not it's kind of convoluted right but i i would agree like um you know green day's american idiot the black parade mm-hmm. um by my chemical mm-hmm. romance actually i was looking at a ranking of um you know uh, rock operas over the years and i was surprised that i was like i didn't realize that that was considered a rock opera and that's those are two albums that i really like very much and i and they got you know very you know very well-known singles and they're very catchy um so i think it can still yeah i think i think i mean for me uh, obviously i don't care so much about the story if the music's there you're gonna get me right mm-hmm. and so john's kind of criticism of the lyrics here is something that i can easily get but past. you know the lyrics um, aren't bad they're just they're yeah. just uh, you know, uh, it, it, ironically, they're probably of all three albums. They're the lyrics that bothered me the least, I'd say. Uh, with that okay. being said, I wouldn't say they're particularly profound either. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, I, it helped me, too, because, Josh, after the first time I listened to it, I had no idea what was going on. And then I read that it was a con- an album, uh, a rock opera. And then I read about the story. So I the more most of the times that I listened to it, I knew what the story mm. was. And I did feel that the, I saw where the music was complementing that story. Um, but at the end of the day, that's, it was the music that really 
you know, um, and the variety and just the creative and, and just being shocked at how surprised I was that I just didn't know about. It. I think that, that, that definitely added some, uh, enjoyment for me. Um, I also just saw that, uh, that Phil May, the lead singer just died, hmm. Hmm. Okay. died at 75 in May, like last month. He's been, he just died last month. So um, RIP. I just saw that pop up. Yeah. Not in a dirigible accident. Yes. Hopefully not. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. So, and and you know what? Dirigible accidents are about the right place to let you know that things are coming to an end, I think, (laughs) for the second.